Sooth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me. You say it wearies you, but how I caught it, found it, or came by it. What stuff it is made of, whereof it is born. I am to learn. Such a want with sadness makes of me that I have much ado to know myself. Your mind is tossing on the ocean. There, where your Argus is with portly sail, like seniors and rich burghers on the flood. Or, as it were, the pageants of the sea do overpeer the petty traffickers that curtsy to them, do them reverence as they fly by them with their woven wings. <clears throat> Believe me, sir, had I such ventures forth, the better part of my affections would be with my hopes abroad. I should be still uh, plucking the grass uh, to know where sits the wind, peering in maps for ports and piers and roads, and every object that might make me fear misfortune to my ventures, uh, out of doubt, would make me sad. My wind cooling my broth would blow me to an ague, and I thought what harm a wind too great might do at sea. I should not see the sandy hourglass run, but I should think of shallows and of flats, and see my wealthy Andrew docked in sand, veiling her high top lower than her ribs to kiss her burial. Should I go to church and see the holy edifice of stone and not bethink me straight of dangerous rocks, which touching with my gentle vessel's side would scatter all her spices on the stream, enrobe the roaring waters with my silks, and in a word, but even now worth this and now worth nothing. <clears throat> Shall I have the thought to think on this? And shall I lack the thought that such a thing by chance would make me sad? But tell not me I know Antonio is sad to think upon his merchandise. <laughs> Believe me, no. I thank my fortune for it. My ventures are not in one bottom trusted, nor to one place. Nor is my whole estate upon the fortunes of this present year. Therefore, my, my merchandise makes me not sad. Why, then you are in love. Oh, Oh, not in love, neither. Hmm? Then let us say you are sad because you are not merry. <laughs> and it's easy for you to laugh and leap and say you are merry because you are not sad. Hmm. Now, by two-headed Janus, nature hath framed strange fellows in her time. Some that will evermore peep through their eyes and laugh like parrots at a bagpiper. And others, of such vinegar aspect, They'll not show their teeth in way of smile, though Nestor swear the jest be laughable. Uh, uh, here comes Bassanio, your most noble kinsman. <laughs> Graciano and Lorenzo. Fare you well. We'll uh, leave you now with better company. I should have stayed till I'd made you merry, if worthier friends had not prevented me. But your worth is very dear in my regard. I take it your own business calls on you, and you, you embrace the occasion to depart. Good morning, my good lord. Good signors, both when shall we laugh? Say when. You grow exceeding strange. Must it be so? We'll make our leisures to attend on yours. <laughs> 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 my lord Bassanio, since you found Antonio, we too will leave you. But at dinner time, I pray you, have in mind where we must meet. I will not fail you. You look not well, Signor Antonio. With too much respect upon the world, they lose it that do buy it with much care. Believe me, you are marvellously changed. I hold the world but as the world, Graciano. A stage where every man must play a part, and mine a sad one. <laughs> well, let me play the fool. With mirth and laughter let old wrinkles come, and let my liver rather heat with wine than my heart cool with mortifying groans. Why should a man? whose blood is warm within, sit like his grandsire, cut in alabaster, sleep when he wakes and creep into the jaundice by being peevish. I tell thee what, Antonio, I love thee and it is my love that speaks. There are a sort of men whose visages do cream and mantle like a standing pond and do a willful stillness entertain with purpose to be dressed in an opinion of wisdom, gravity, profound conceit, as who should say, I am Sir Oracle, and when I open my lips, let no dog bark. <laughs> oh, my Antonio, I do know of these that therefore only are reputed wise for saying nothing. But I'm very sure if they should speak, would almost damn those ears which, hearing them, will call their brothers fools. <laughs> I'll tell thee more of this another time. But fish not with this melancholy bait, for this fool's gudgeon, this opinion. Come, good Lorenzo, fare you well a while. I'll end my exhortation after dinner. <laughs> well, we will leave you then till dinner time. 
I must be one of these same dumb wise men, for Gratiano never lets me speak. No, oh. keep me company but two years more, thou shalt not know the sound of thine own tongue. <laughs> so farewell, I'll grow a talker for this gear. Well, fancy faith, for silence is only commendable in a neat tongue dried and a maid not vendable. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> Is that anything now? Well, oh, Graciano speaks an infinite deal of nothing more than any man in all Venice. His reasons are as two grains of wheat hid in two bushels of chaff. You shall seek all day ere you find them, and when you have them, they're not worth the search. Oh. Well, tell me now. What lady is the same to whom you swore a secret pilgrimage that you today promised to tell me of? It is not unknown to you, Antonio, how much I have disabled mine estate by something showing a more swelling port than my faint means would grant continuance. Nor do I now make moan to be abridged from such a noble rate, but my chief care is to come fairly off from those great debts wherein my time Something too prodigal hath left me gauged. To you, Antonio, I owe the most in money and, and in love. And from your love I have a warranty to unburthen all my plots and purposes how to get clear of all the debts I owe. And I pray you, good Bassanio, let me know it. And if it stands as you yourself still do, within the eye of honor, be assured my, my purse, my person, my extremist means lie all unlocked to your occasion. In my school days, when I had lost one shaft, I shot his fellow of the self-same flight the self-same way, with more advised watch to find the other fourth. And by adventuring both, I oft found both. <laughs> I urge this childhood proof for what follows is pure innocence. I owe you much. And like a willful youth, that which I owe is lost. But if you please to shoot another, arrow that self-way which you did shoot the first i do not doubt as i shall watch the aim or to find both or bring your latter hazard back again and thankfully rest debtor for the first you know me well and herein spend but time to wind about my love with circumstance and out of doubt you do me now more wrong in making question of my uttermost than if you had made waste of all i have then do but say to me what i should do that in your knowledge may by me be done. I am pressed unto it. Therefore speak. In Belmont is a lady richly left. And she is fair. And fairer than that word of wondrous virtues. Sometimes from her eyes I did receive fair speechless messages. Her name is Portia. Nothing undervalued to Cato's daughter, Brutus Portia. What is the wide world ignorant of her worth? For the four winds blow in from every coast renowned suitors. And her sunny locks hang on her temples like a golden fleece which make her seat of Belmont culture strand, and many Jasons come in quest of her. Oh, my Antonio, had I but the means to hold a rival place with one of them, I have a mind presages me such thrift that I should questionless be fortunate. Mm. Well, thou knowest that all my fortunes are at sea. Neither have I money nor commodity to raise a present sum. Therefore, go forth, try what my credit can in Venice do. That shall be racked even to the uttermost to furnish thee to Belmont, to fair Portia. I go presently inquire and say, will I, where money is. And I no question make to have it of my trust or, or my safety.
Why, my troth, Nerissa, my little body is a weary of this great world. You would be, sweet madam, if your miseries were in the same abundance as your good fortunes are. And yet, for aught I see, they are as sick that surfeit with too much as they that starve with nothing. It is no mean happiness, therefore, to be seated in the mean. Superfluity comes sooner by white hairs, but competency lives longer. Good sentences and well pronounced. They would be better if well followed. If to do were as easy as to know what were good to do, chapels had been churches, and poor men's cottages, princes' palaces. It is a good divine that follows his own instructions. I can easier teach twenty what were good to be done than be one of the twenty to follow my own teaching. The brain may devise laws for the blood, but a hot temper leaps o'er a cold decree. <laughs> but this reasoning is not in the fashion to choose me a husband. <laughs> oh, me the word choose. I may neither choose whom I would, nor refuse whom I dislike. So is the will of a living daughter curbed by the will of a dead father. Is it not hard, Nerissa, that I cannot choose one nor refuse none? Your father was ever virtuous. And holy men at their death have good inspirations. Therefore, the lottery that he hath devised in these three chests of gold, silver and lead, whereof who chooses his meaning chooses you, will no doubt never be chosen by any rightly, but one who you shall rightly love. Oh. <laughs> but what warmth is there? in your affections towards any of these princely suitors that are already come. I prithee overname them, and as thou namest them, I will describe them, and according to my description, level at my affection. First, there is the Neapolitan prince. Mm -hmm. Oh, aye, there's a colt indeed. For well, he doth nothing but talk of his horse. And he makes it a great appropriation to his own good parts that he can shoe him himself. I much afeard my lady his mother played false with a smith. Then there is the county palatine. No, he doth nothing but frown. As who should say, and you will not have me choose. I'd rather be married to a death's head with a bone in his mouth than to either of these. God defend me from these two. How say you by the French lord, Monsieur Le Bon? God made him, and therefore let him pass for a man. <laughs> oh, in truth, I know it is a sin to be a mocker, but he... <laughs> he hath a horse better than the Neapolitans, a better bad habit of frowning than the County Palatine. He's every man and no man. <laughs> if a throstle saying he falls straight at capering, he will fence with his own shadow. If I should marry him, I should marry twenty husbands. If he would despise me, I would forgive him. But if he loved me to madness... I will never requite him. What say you then to Falconbridge, the young baron of England? You know I say nothing to him, for he understands not me, nor I him. He hath neither French, Latin, nor Italian. And you will come into the court and swear I have a poor mm. pennyworth. Mm. Or the English. Mm. He is a proper man's picture. <laughs> but alas, who can converse with a dumb show? And how oddly he is suited. How like you the young German? Mm. The Duke of Saxon is nephew. Very vilely in the morning when he is sober, and most vilely in the afternoon when he is drunk. When he is best, he is a little worse than a man, and when he is worst, he's little better than a beast. And the worst of all that ever fell, I hope I shall make shift to go without him. If he should offer to choose, and choose the right casket, you should refuse to perform your father's will if you should refuse to accept him. Well, therefore, for fear of the worst, I pray thee, set a deep glass of Rhenish wine on the contrary casket. But if the devil be within, and that temptation without, I know he will choose Madam? It. I will do anything, Nerissa, ere I will be married to a sponge. You need not fear, lady, the having any of these lords. They have acquainted me with their determinations, which is indeed to return to their home and to trouble you with no more suit. Unless you may be won by some other sort than your father's imposition, depending on the caskets. If I live to be as old as Sibylla, I will die as chaste as Diana, unless I be obtained by the manner of my father's will. I'm glad this parcel of wooers is so reasonable. 
For there is not one among them, but I dote on his very absence, and I pray God grant them a fair departure. Do you not remember, lady, in your father's time, a young Venetian? A scholar and a soldier that came hither in the company of the Marquis de Montferrat. Yes. Yes, it was Bassanio. As I think, so is he called. True, madam. He, of all men that ever my foolish eyes looked upon, was the best deserving of fair lady. I remember him well. <laughs> and I remember him worthy of thy praise. <laughs> How now? What news? The four strangers seek for you, ma'am, to take their leave. And there is a forerunner come from a fifth, the Prince of Morocco. Oh? who brings word the prince, his master, will be here tonight. If I could bid the fifth welcome with so good a heart as I can bid the other four farewell, I should be glad of his approach. If he had the condition of a saint and the complexion of a devil, I had rather he should shrive me than wise Shh. me. Come, Larissa, said I go before. Whilst we shut the gate upon one wooer, another knocks at the door. <laughs> Three. Thousand ducats. Well. I sir, for three months. For uh, three months. Well? For the which, as I told you, Antonio shall be bound. Antonio is to become bound. Well. May you stead me? Will you pleasure me? Shall I know your answer? Three thousand ducats for three months and Antonio bound. Your answer to that. Antonio is a good man. Have you had an imputation to the contrary? <laughs> no, 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 no. My meaning in saying he's a good man is to have you understand me that he is sufficient, yet his means are in supposition. He hath an argosy bound for Tripolis. Another for the Indy. I understand, moreover, upon the Rialto, he hath the third at Mexico, a fourth for England, and other ventures he hath Squandered abroad. But uh, ships are but boards, sailors but men. There be land rats and water rats, land thieves and water thieves, I mean, uh -huh. uh, pirates. <laughs> and uh, then there is peril of waters, winds, and rocks. The man is notwithstanding sufficient. Three thousand ducats. Hmm. I think I may take his bond. Be assured you may. Oh, I will be assured I may. And that I may be assured, I will bethink me. May I uh, speak with uh, Antonio? Uh, if it please you to dine with us. <laughs> to smell pork. Oh. To eat of the habitation which your prophet, the Nazarite, conjured the devil into. Mm. I will buy with you, sell with you, walk with you, talk with you, and so follow him. But I will not eat with you, drink with you, nor pray with you. <laughs> What news on the Rialto? <laughs> yeah, but who is he comes here? This is Signor Antonio. Shylock. I'm debating of my present store. And by the near guess of my memory, I cannot instantly raise up the gross of full 3,000 ducats. What of that? Tubal, a wealthy Hebrew of my tribe will furnish me. But soft, how many months do you desire? Rest you fair, good senior. Your worship was the last man in our mouths. Shiloh, albeit I neither lend nor borrow by taking nor by giving of excess, yet to supply the ripe wants of my friend, I'll break a custom. Is he yet possessed how much he would? Aye, aye, three thousand ducats. And for three months. For three months, I had forgot. You told me so. Uh, well, then you're bond and let me see. But soft, you, methoughts you said, you neither lend nor borrow upon advantage. I do never use it. When Jacob grazed his uncle Laban's sheep, uh, this Jacob from uh, Holy Abraham was, as his wise mother wrought in his behalf, the third possessor. He was the third. And what of him? Did he take interest? No, not take interest. Not, as you would say, directly interest. Mark what Jacob did. When Laban and himself were compromised that all the Enlins which were streaked and pied should fall as Jacob's hire, the ewes being rank in the end of autumn turned to the rams. 
And when the work of generation was between these woolly breeders in the act, a skillful shepherd peeled me certain ones, and in the doing of the deed of kind, he stuck them up before the fulsome ewes, who then conceiving did in e'en in time fall party colored lambs, and those were Jacob's. <laughs> this was a way to thrive, and he was blessed, for thrift is blessing, <laughs> if men steal it not. This was a venture, sir, that Jacob served for, a thing not in his power to bring to pass, but swayed and fashioned by the hand of heaven. Was this inserted to make interest good, or is your gold and silver used and ran? I cannot tell. I make it breed as fast. <laughs> but note me, see. Mark this, Bassanio. Hmm? The devil can cite scripture for his purpose. An evil cell producing holy witness is like a villain with a smiling cheek, a goodly apple rotten at the heart. Ugh, what a goodly outside falsehood hair. Uh, Three thousand ducats, tis a good round sum. Three months from twelve, then let me see the rate. Well, Shiloh, shall we be beholding to you? Signor Antonio, many a time and oft in the Rialto you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Uh, still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spit upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for use of that which is mine own. Well then, now appears you need my help. Go to then. You come to me, and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so. You, that did void your room upon my beard and foot me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Money's is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say, hath a dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend 3,000 ducats? Or should I bend low and in a bondman's key with bated breath and whisper in humble and say this, Pether, you spit upon me when till last, you burn me such a time. Another day you call me dog and for these courtesies I'll lend you thus much money. I am like to call thee so again, to spit on thee again, to spurn thee too. If thou wilt lend this money, lend it not as to thy friends. For when did friendship take a breed for barren metal of a friend? No, lend it rather to thine enemy. Or if he break, thou mayst with better face exact the penalty. Well, look you, how you storm. I would be friends with you and have your love. Forget the shames that you have stained me with. Supply your present wants and take no doit of usance for my monies, and you'll not hear me. This is kind I offer. This were kindness. Uh, this kindness. Well, I shall go with me to a notary. Seal me there, your single bond, and in a merry sport. If you repay me not on such a day, in such a place, such sum or sums as are expressed in the condition, let the profit be nominated for an equal pound of your fair flesh, to be cut off and taken in what part of your body pleaseth me. <laughs> <laughs> Content! If faith, I'll seal to such a bond, and say there is much kindness in the Jew. Well, you shall not seal to such a bond for me. I I'd rather dwell in my necessity. I fear not, man, I will not forfeit it. Within these two months, that's a month before this bond expires. I do expect return of thrice three times the value of the bond. Oh, Father Abram, what these Christians are, whose own hard dealings teaches them suspect the thoughts of others. Pray you, tell me this. If he should break his day, what should I gain by the exaction of the forfeiture? A pound of man's flesh taken from a man is not so estimable. Profitable neither as flesh of muttons, beefs, or goats, I say to buy his favor, I extend this friendship, if he will take it so. If not, adieu, and for my love, I pray you wrongly now. Yes, Sherlock, I will seal under this bond. Then go we forthwith to the notary, give him direction for this merry bond, and I will go and purse the ducats straight. See to my house, left in the fearful guard of an unthrifty knave, and presently I'll be with you. I the gentle Jew. <laughs> the Hebrew will turn Christian. He grows kind. I like not fair terms, and a villain's mind. Now, come on. In this there can be no dismay. My ships come home a month before the day. Signor Bassanio, 
Cristiano! I have suit to you. You have obtained it. You must not deny me. I must go with you to Belmont. Well, then you must. But here the Graciano. Thou art too wild, too rude, and bold of voice. Parts that become thee happily enough, and in such eyes as ours appear not false. But where thou art not known, why, there they appear something too liberal. I pray thee, take pains to allay with some cold drops of modesty thy skipping spirit, lest through thy wild behaviour I be misconstrued in the place I go to, and lose my hopes. My lord Bassanio, hear me. If I do not put on a sober habit, talk with respect, and swear, but now and then. Uh, wear prayer books in my pocket, look demurely, nay more, while Grace is saying, hood mine eyes thus with my hat, and sigh and say, Amen. Use all the observance of civility, like one well studied in a sad ostent pleases grandam. Never trust me more. Mm -hmm. Well, we shall see your bearing. Nay, but I bar tonight. You shall not gauge me by what we do tonight. No, that but pity. I would rather entreat you to put on your boldest suit of mirth. We have friends that purpose merriment. But fairly well, I have some business. And I must to Lorenzo and the rest, but we will visit you at supper time. Sorry thou would leave my father so. Our house is hell. And thou, a merry devil, didst rob it of some taste of tediousness. But fare thee well. Oh, there is a ducket for thee. Yeah, what should and Lancelot, soon at supper thou shalt see Lorenzo, who is thy new master, Lord Bassanio's guest. Give him this letter. Ah, Shh. Would... Do it secretly. And so farewell. I would not have my father see me and talk with thee. Adieu. Tears exhibit my tongue, most beautiful pagan, most sweet Jew. If a Christian do not play the knave and get the arm, much deceived. But adieu. These foolish drops do some in drown my manly spirit. Adieu. Farewell, good Lancelot. Lack what heinous sin is it in me to be ashamed to be my father's child. But though I am daughter to his blood, I am not to his manners. Oh, Lorenzo, if thou keep promise, I shall end this strife. Become a Christian. And thy loving wife. Nay, we will slink away in supper time, disguise us at my lodging, and return all in an hour. We have not made good preparation. We have not spoke as yet of torchbear. Oh, tis vile, unless it may be quaintly ordered, and better in my mind not undertook. It is now but four o'clock. We have two hours to furnish us. Friend Lancelot, what's the news? And it shall please you to break up this, it shall seem to signify. Uh, I know the hand in faith, tis a fair hand, and whiter than the paper it writ on is the fair hand that writ. Love news, if faith. By your leave, sir. So, whither goest thou? Marry, sir, to bid my old master the Jew sup tonight with my new master the Christian. Hold. Here. Take this. Tell gentle Jessica I will not fail her. Oh, and speak it privately. Go. Gentlemen, will you prepare you for this mask tonight? I am provided of a torch bearer. Aye, Mary, I'll be gone about it straight. And so will I. Meet me and Graciano at Graciano's lodgings of our heads. It's good we do so. Is not this letter from fair Jessica? I must needs tell thee all. She hath directed how I shall take her from her father's house, what gold and jewels she is furnished with, what pages suit she hath in readiness. If e'er the Jew her father come to heaven, it'll be for his gentle daughter's sake. Come, go with me. Peruse this as thou goest. Fair Jessica shall be my torch-bearer. Well, thou shalt see. Thy eyes shall be thy judge. The difference of old Shylock and base Anio. What, Jessica? Thou shalt not gormandize as thou hast done with me. What, Jessica? And sleep and snore and rend a panel out. Why, Jessica, I say? Why, Jessica? Who did pretty call? I did not bid thee call. Well, your worship was wont to tell me I could do nothing without bidding. Call you? I what is your will? Bid forth to supper, Jessica. Here are my keys. Yet wherefore should I go? Not bid for love. They flatter me. But yet I'll go in hate and feed upon the prodigal Christian. <laughs> 
Jessica McGill, look to my house. I'm right loath to go. There is some ill a brewing towards my rest, for I did dream of money bags tonight. I beseech you, sir, go. My young master doth expect your reproach. <laughs> so do I hear. And they have conspired <laughs> together. I will not say you shall see a mask. But if you what? do, then it was not for nothing. What? My nose fell a breeding on Black Monday what? last at six o'clock in the morning. Four out that year, last Wednesday. It was four years in the afternoon. What? Are there masks? Here you be, Jessica. Lock up my doors. And when you hear the drum and the bile squealing at the right necked fife, clamber you not out to the casements then, nor thrust your head into the public streets to gaze on Christian fools with varnished faces, but stop my house's ears. I mean my casement. Let not the sound of shallow foppery enter my sober house. By Jacob's staff, I swear, I have no mind of feasting forth tonight. <laughs> Yet I will go. Go you before, sir, I say I will. I will go before, sir. Mistress, look out at window for all this. There will come a Christian by will be worth a Jewess eye. <laughs> what said that fool of Hagar's offspring, huh? His words were farewell, mistress. Nothing else. The patch is kind enough, but a huge feeder. Snails slow in profit, and he sleeps by day more than the wildcat. Drones hive not with me, and therefore I part with him. And part with him to one that I would have him help to waste his borrowed purse. Oh, Jessica, go in. Perhaps I will return immediately. Do as I bid you. Shut doors after you. Fast fine, fast fine. Proverb never stale in thrifty mind. Farewell. And if my fortune be not crossed, I have a father, you a daughter lost. Mislike me not for my complexion. The shadowed livery of the burnished sun to whom I am a neighbor and near bred. Bring me the fairest creature northward born, where Phoebus fire scarce thaws the icicles, and let us make incision for your love to prove whose blood is reddest, his or mine. I tell thee, lady, this aspect of mine hath feared the valiant. By my love, I swear, the best regarded virgins of our clime have loved it too. I would not change this, who, except to steal your thoughts, my gentle queen. <laughs> In terms of choice, I am not solely led by nice direction of a maiden's eyes. Besides, the lottery of my destiny bars me the right of voluntary choosing. But if my father had not scanted me and hedged me by his wit, to yield myself his wife, who wins me by that means, I told you, your self-renowned prince then stood as fair as any comer I have looked on yet for my affection. Even for that, I thank you. <laughs> by this scimitar that slew the Sophie and a Persian prince, that won three fields of Sultan Solomon, I would outstare the sternest eyes that look, outbrave the heart most daring on the earth. Pluck the young sucking cub from the she bear, yet mock the lion when he roar for prey. To win thee, lady. Yeah, you must take your chance, and either not attempt to choose at all, or swear before you choose, if you choose wrong, never to speak to lady afterwards in way of marriage, therefore be advised. No, will not. Come, bring me unto my chance. Go, make your choice. Hmm. The first of gold, which this inscription bear, who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. The second, silver, which this promise carry, who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. The third, dull lead, with warning all as blunt, 
who chooseth me must give an hazard only half. Hmm. How shall I know if I do choose the right? The one of them contains my picture, Prince. If you choose that, then I am yours with all. Some god direct my judgment. Let me see. I will survey the inscriptions back again. <laughs> what says this leaden casket? Who chooseth me must give an hazard all he hath. Must give. For what? For lead. Hazard all for lead. <laughs> this casket threatens. Men that hazard all do it in hope of fair advantages. A golden mind stoops not to show the dross. Therefore, I'll give no hazard aught for lead. Silver. Silver. What says this silver with her virgin who? Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. As much as he deserves. Pause there, Morocco, and weigh thy value with an even hand. If thou beest rated by the estimation, thou dost deserve enough. And yet enough may not extend so far as to the lady. And yet to be a fear of my deserving were but a weak disabling of my symbolism. I come to like. As much as I deserve. <laughs> Why, that's the lady. I do in birth deserve her, and in fortunes, graces, qualities are breeding. But more than this, in love, I do deserve. <laughs> what if I strayed no further, but chose here? <laughs> hey, let's see once more this scene graved in gold. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. Why, that's the lady. Deliver me the key. Here do I choose and thry by as I may. There, take it, Prince. And if my form lie there, then I am yours. Oh, hell. What have we here? A carrion death within whose empty eye there is a written scroll. I read the writing. All that glisters is not gold. Often have you heard that told. Till the tombs to worms enfold. Fare you well, your suit is cold. Cold indeed, and labor lost. Then farewell heat and welcome frost. Portia, adieu. I have to grieve the heart to take a tedious leave. Thus losers part. A gentle riddance, go. Let all of his complexion choose me so. Behold, there stand the caskets, noble prince. If you choose that wherein I am contained, straight shall our nuptial rites be solemnized. But if you fail, without more speech, my lord, you must be gone from hence immediately. I am enjoined by all to observe three things. First... But to these injunctions, everyone doth swear that comes to hazard for my worthless self. And so have I addressed me. Fortune now to my heart's hope. Gold. <laughs> Silver. And base lead. Who 
chooseth me must give and hazard all he has. You shall look fairer ere I give or hazard. <laughs> what says the golden casket? <coughs> Let me see. Who chooses me? Who chooses me? <laughs> chooses me. Who chooses me shall gain what many men desire. What many men desire. By that many may be meant the fool multitude that choose by show. Not knowing more than the fond I does teach, which prize not to the interior, but like the martlet, builds in the weather on the outward wall, even in the very force and rude of casualty. I will, I will not choose what many men desire, because I will not jump with common spirits, nor rank me with the barber of smartitude, why then to thee thou silver treasure house. <laughs> Tell me once more what title thou dost bear. Now, who chooseth me? Who chooseth me? Shall get as much as he deserves. Shall get, and well said too. For who shall go about to cousin fortune and be honorable without the stamp of merit. Let none presume to wear an undeserved dignity. All the degrees, estates and offices were not derived corruptly, and that pure honor were purchased by the merit of the wearer. How many then should cover that stand bare? How many be commanded that command? How much low peasantry would then be gleaned from the true seed of honor, and how much honor picked from the chaff and ruin of the times to be new varnished. But to my choice, who chooses me, who chooses, who chooses me, shall have as much as he deserves. I will assume desert. Give me the key for this, and instantly unlock my fortunes here. Watch this. <laughs> the, the, the portrait of a blinking idiot. <laughs> Who chooses me <laughs> shall have as much as he deserves. Did I deserve no more than a fool's head? Is that my prize? Are my deserts no better? To offend and judge are distinct offices and of opposed natures. <laughs> With one fool's head I came to woo, but I go away with two. <laughs> Sweet at you, I'll keep my oath patiently to bear my wrath. <laughs> Thus have the candles singed the moth. <laughs> Ma'am, there is a light at your gate, a young Venetian, one that comes before to signify the approaching of his lord from whom he bringeth sensible regrets, to wit, besides commends and courteous breath, gifts of rich value. Yet I have not seen so likely an ambassador of love. A day in April never came so sweet to show how costly summer was at hand as this forspearer comes before his lord. No more, I, I pray thee. 
I'm half of here, Dulce, and on here. Some kin to thee, thou spend such high day wit and praise. <laughs> <laughs> come, come, Nerissa, for I long to see quick Cupid's post that comes so manly. Bassanio, Lord, love, if thy will it be. news on the Rialto? Why, yet it lives there, unchecked, that Antonio hath a ship of rich lading wrecked on the narrow seas. The, uh, Goodwins? Uh, I think they call the place. A very dangerous, flat and fatal, where the carcasses of many a tall ship lie buried. As they say, if my gossip report be an honest woman of her word. Mm. I would she were as lying of gossip in that as ever napped ginger, or made her neighbours believe she wept for the death of a third husband. But it is true, without any slips of prolixity or crossing the plain highway of talk, that the good Antonio, the honest Antonio, oh, that I had a title good enough to keep his name company. Come, and... come. What says that? The full stop. Why? The end is, he hath lost a ship. I would it might prove the end of his losses. Let me say amen betimes, lest the devil cross my prayer, for here he comes in the likeness of a Jew. Hannah, Shylock, what news among the merchants? You knew none so well, none so well as you, of my daughter's plight. That's certain. I, for my part, knew the tailor that made the wings she flew withal. <laughs> and Shylock, for his own part, knew the bird was fledged. And then it is the complexion of them all to leave the dam. She is damned for it. That's certain if the devil may be her judge. My own flesh and blood to revolt. Out upon it, old carrion. Revolts it at these years. I say, my daughter is my flesh and blood. There is more difference between thy flesh and hers than between jet and ivory. More between your bloods than there is between red wine and Rhenish. Uh, but tell us, do you hear whether Antonio have had any loss yes! of... Oh, no, no, bad match, a bankrupt, a prodigal, the dust cast show his head in the Rialto! A beggar that was used to come so smug upon the mart! <laughs> Let him look to his bond. He was wont to call me usurer. Let him look to his bond. He was used to lend out monies for Christian courtesy. Let him look to his bond. I'm sure if he forfeit, thou wilt not take his flesh. <laughs> What's that good for? to bait fish with her. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million. Laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, called my friends. He heated mine enemies, and what is his reason? I'm a Jew. <laughs> That's not a Jew. I... It's not a Jew. Hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions. 
If you prick us, do we not bleed? Tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Why? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be? By Christian example. Why? If we... The villainy you teach me, I will execute. And it shall go hard. But I will better the instruction. Gentlemen, my master Antonio is at his house and desires to speak with you both. We have been up and down to seek him. Ah, oh, here comes another of the tribe. A third cannot be matched unless the devil himself turn Jew. How now, Tuba? What news from Genoa? Hast thou found my daughter? I often came where I did hear of her, but cannot find her. Clive, there, there, there. A diamond gone cost me 2,000 ducats in Frankfurt. The curse never fell upon our nation till now. Mm. I never felt it till now. 2,000 is that another precious, precious jewels. I want my daughter were dead at my foot, and if she was in her ear, I wish she were hurst at my foot of the ducks and said I copied. No news of them. I so well. I had no loss, what lost to the search. Why that loss upon loss? The thief gone with so much and so much to find the thief, and no satisfaction, no revenge, no ill luck stirring. But what lights on my shoulders? No sighs but of my breathing, my own no tears, but my shadow. Yes, other men have ill luck too. Antonio, what? as I heard in Genoa. What? Ill luck. Ill luck. Hath an argosy cast away coming from Tripolis. <laughs> He's a god! He's a god! Is it true? Is it true? I spoke with some of the sailors that escaped the wreck. <laughs> Fancy good to my good news, good news. <laughs> but what about else didst thou hear in Genoa? Your daughter spent in Genoa, as I heard, one night, four score ducats. As sticks the dagger in me, shall never see my gold again. Four score ducats at a sitting. Four score ducats. There came divers of Antonio's creditors in my company to Venice that swear he cannot choose but break. I'm very glad of it. Plague him. Torture him. I'm glad of it. One of them showed me a ring that he had of your daughter. For a monkey? It was my turquoise. I had it of Leah when I was a bachelor. I would not have given in. Of monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Antonio is 
certainly undone. As true as, as I true. Go to Fee me an officer. Bespeak him a fortnight before. I will have the heart of him if he forfeit. <laughs> Go to Bal. Meet me at our synagogue. Go, good to Bal. At our synagogue. I pray you tarry. Pause a day or two before you hazard. For in choosing wrong, I lose your company. Therefore, forbear a while. There's something tells me, but it is not love. I would not lose you. And you know yourself hate counsels not in such a quality. But lest you should not understand me well, and yet a maiden hath no tongue but thought, I would detain you here some month or two before you venture for me. I could teach you how to choose right, but then I am forsworn. So will I never be. So may you miss me. And if you do, you make me wish a sin that I had been forsworn. Oh, beshrew your eyes. They have all looked me and divided me. One half of me is yours, the other half Yours. Mine own, I would say, but if mine, then yours, and so all yours. Oh, these naughty times put bars between the owners and their rights, and so though yours not yours. Prove it so, let fortune go to hell, for it not I. I speak too long. But tis to please the time, to eke it and to draw it out in length to stay you from election. Let me choose. For as I am, I live upon the rack. Upon the rack, Bassanio? Then confess what treason there is mingled with your love. None but that ugly treason of mistrust which makes me fear the enjoying of my love. There may as well be amity and life between snow and fire as treason of my love. Aye, but I fear you speak upon the rack, where men, enforced, do speak anything. Promise me life and I'll confess the truth. Well then, confess and live. Confess and love had been the very son of my confession. Oh, happy torment, when my torturer doth teach me answers for deliverance. But let me to my fortune and the caskets. Away, then. I am locked in one of them. If you do love me, you will find me out. Nerissa and the rest stand all aloof. Let music sound while he doth make his choice. Then if he lose, he makes a swan-like end, fading in music. That the comparison may stand more proper, my eye shall be the stream and watery deathbed for him. He may win, and what is music then? Then music is even as the flourish when true subjects bow to a new crowned monarch. Such it is as are those dulcet sounds in break of day that creep into the dreaming bridegroom's ear and summon him to marriage. Go, Hercules. Live thou, I live. With much, much more dismay, I view the fight than thou that makest the fray.
is still deceived with ornament. Look on beauty and you shall see it is purchased by the weight, which therein works a miracle in nature, making them lightest that wear most of it. Now there's no vice so simple but assume some mark of virtue on his outward parts. Thus ornament is but the guileed shore to a most dangerous sea, the beauteous scarf veiling an Indian. Beauty, in a word, the seeming truth which cunning times put on to entrap the wisest. Therefore thou gaudy gold, hard food for Midas, I will none of thee. Nor none of thee, thou pale and common drudge between man and man. But thou, thou meagre lead. Which rather threatenest than dost promise aught. Thy plainness moves me more than eloquence. And here choose I, joy be the consequence. What find I here? Fair Portia's counterfeit. What demigod hath come so near creation? Move these eyes, or whether riding on the balls of mine seem they in motion? Here are severed lips parted with sugar breath, so sweet a bar should sunder such sweet friends. Here in her hairs, the painter plays the spider, and hath woven a golden mesh to entrap the hearts of men faster than gnats in cobwebs. But her eyes, how could he see to do them? Having made one, methinks it should have power to steal both his and leave itself unfurnished. Here is the scroll of the summary and continent of my fortune. You that choose not by the view, chance as fair and choose as true. Since this fortune falls to you, be content and seek no new. If you be well pleased with this and hold your fortune for your bliss, turn you where your lady is and claim her with a loving kiss. Fair lady, by your leave, I come by note to give and to receive, as doubtful whether what I see be true, until confirmed, signed, ratified by you. You see me, Lord Bassani, where I stand, such as I am. Though for myself alone, I would not be ambitious in my wish to wish myself much better, yet for you, I would be trebled twenty times myself, a thousand times more fair. 
10,000 times more rich. That only to stand high in your account, I might in virtues, beauties, livings, friends, exceed account. But the full sum of me is sum of something, which to term in gross is an unlessened girl, unschooled, unpracticed. Happy in this, she is not yet so old, but she may learn. Happier than this, she is not bred so dull, but she can learn. And happiest of all is that her gentle spirit commits itself to yours, to be directed as from her lord, her governor, her king. Myself and what is mine to you and yours is now converted. But now I was the lord of this fair mansion, master of my servants, queen or myself. And even now, but now, this house, these servants, and this same myself are yours, my lords. I give them with this ring, which when you part from, lose or give away, let it presage the ruin of your love and be my vantage to exclaim on you. Madam, you have bereft me of all words. My blood speaks to you in my veins. There is such confusion in my powers expressed and not expressed. But when this ring parts from this finger, then parts life from hence. Or then be bold to say, Bassanio's dead. <clears throat> uh, my lord and lady, it is now our time to have stood by and seen our wishes prosper to cry good joy, good joy, my lord and lady. My lord Bassanio and my gentle lady, I wish you all the joy that you can wish, for I'm sure you can wish none from me. And when your honours mean to solemnise the bargain of your faith, I do beseech you, even at that time, I may be married too. With all my heart, so that I can get a wife. Uh, thank you, lordship, you've got me one. My eyes, my lord, can look as swift as yours. You saw the mistress, I beheld the maid. You loved, I loved. For intermission no more pertains to me, my lord, than you. Your fortune stood upon the caskets there, and so did mine too, as the matter falls. For swearing till my very roof was dry with oaths of love, at last, if promise last, I got a promise of this fair one here, to have her love, and provided your fortune achieved her mistress. Is this true, Nerissa? Madam, it is. <laughs> so you sound pleased with all. And do you, Graciano, mean good faith? Oh, yes, faith, my lord. A feast shall be much honoured by your marriage. We'll play them the first boy for a thousand ducats. <laughs> stake down. Oh, no, we shall ne'er win at that sport and stake down. <laughs> what, who comes here? Lorenzo and his infidel. What, and my old Venetian friend Solerio? Lorenzo and Solerio, welcome hither. If the youth of my new interest have power to bid them welcome, by your leave I bid my friends and very countrymen sweet Portia welcome. So do I, my lord. They are entirely welcome. I thank your honour. For my part, my lord, my purpose was not to have seen you here, but meeting with Salerio, by the way, he did entreat me past all saying nay to come with him along. I did, my lord, and I have reason for it. Signor Antonio commends him to you. Had I opened this letter, tell me how my good friend doth. Not sick, my lord, unless it be in mind. Nor well, unless in mind. His letter there will show you his estate. Conor is a cheer yon stranger. Bid her welcome. Your hand, Salerio. What's the news from Venice? How doth our royal merchant, good Antonio? I know be pleased with our success. We are the Jasons. We have won the fleece. I would you had won the fleece that he hath lost. There are some shrewd contents in yon same paper that steals the colour from Bassanio's cheek. With leave, Bassanio, I am half yourself, and I must freely have the half of anything that this same paper brings you. Sweet Portia, here are a few of the unpleasantest words that ever blotted paper. Gentle lady, <laughs> I have engaged myself to my dear friend. Engaged my friend to his mere enemy. To feed my means. 
It is a letter, lady. The paper is the body of my friend and every word in it a gaping wound issuing life's blood. But is it true? Salerio, had all his ventures failed? What, not one hit? From Tripolis, Mexico, and England, from Lisbon, Barbary, and India, and not one vessel escaped the dreadful touch of merchant marring rocks? Not one, my lord. Besides, it should appear if he had the present money to discharge the Jew, he would not take it. Never did I know a creature that did bear the shape of man so keen and greedy to confound a man. He plies the Duke at morning and at night and doth impeach the freedom of the state if they deny him justice. Twenty merchants, the Duke himself and the Magnificos of greatest port, have all persuaded with him. But none can drive him from the envious plea of forfeiture, of justice, and his bond. When I was with him, I have heard him swear to Tubal and to Chaucer's countrymen that he would rather have Antonio's flesh than twenty times the value of the son that he did owe him. And I know, my lord, if law, authority, and power deny not, it will go hard with poor Antonio. Is it your dear friend that is thus in trouble? The dearest friend to me, the kindest man, the best conditioned and unwearied spirit in doing courtesies, one in whom the ancient Roman honor doth more appear than any that draws breath in Italy. What sum owes he the Jew? For me, three thousand ducats. What, no more? Pay him six thousand, then deface the bond. Double six thousand, and then treble that, before a friend of this description shall lose a hair through a Bassanio's fault. First go with me to church and call me wife, and then away to Venice to your friend. For never shall you lie by Portia's side with an unquiet soul. You shall have gold to pay the petty debt twenty times a hooper. And when it is paid, bring your true friend along. My maid Nerissa and myself, meantime, will live as maids and widows. Come away. For you shall hence upon your wedding day. Bid your friends welcome. Show a merry cheer. Since you are dear bought, I will love you, dear. Let me hear the letter of your friend. Sweet Bassanio. My ships have all miscarried. My creditors grow cruel. My estate is very low. My bond to the Jew is forfeit. And since in pain it is impossible I should live, all debts are cleared between you and I, if I might but see you at my death. Jada, look to him. Tell me not of mercy. This is the fool that lent out money greatest. Jailer, look to him. Oh, hear me yet, good Shylock. I have my bond. Speak not against my bond. I have sworn an oath that I will have my bond. Thou calls me dog before thou hadst a cause. But since I am a dog, beware my fangs. The Duke shall grant me justice. I do wonder, thou naughty jailer, that thou art so fond to come abroad with him at his request. I pray thee hear me speak. I have my bond, I will not hear thee speak. I have my bond, and therefore speak no more. I thought they made a soft, dull-eyed fool to shake the head, relent and sigh, and yield to Christian intercessors. Follow not. I'll have no speaking. I will have my bond. It is the most impenetrable cur that ever kept with men. Let him alone. I'll follow him no more with bootless prayers. He seeks my life. His reason will I know. I oft delivered from his forfeitures many that ever times made moan to me. Therefore, he hates me. Well, I'm sure the Duke will never grant this forfeiture to hold. The Duke cannot deny the course of law. For the commodity that traitors have with us in Venice, if it be denied, will much impeach the justice of the state, since that the trade and profit of the city consisted of all nations. Therefore, go. 
These griefs and losses have so baited me that I shall hardly spare a pound of flesh tomorrow to my bloody creditor. Little Taylor, on. Pray God Bassanio come. To see me pay my debt. And then I care not. Madam, although I speak it in your presence, you have a noble and a true conceit of godlike amity, which appears most strongly in bearing thus the absence of your lord. But if you knew to whom you show this honor, how true a gentleman you send relief, how dear a lover of my lord, your husband, I know you would be prouder of the work than customary bounty can enforce you. I never did repent for doing good, nor shall not now. Uh -huh. For in companions that do converse and waste the time together, whose souls do bear an equal yoke of love, there must be needs a like proportion of lineaments, of manners, and of spirit. Which makes me think that this Antonio, being the bosom lover of my lord, must needs be like my lord. <laughs> if it be so, how little is the cost I have bestowed in purchasing the semblance of my soul from out the state of hellish cruelty. That this comes to near the praising of myself, therefore no more of it. Here are other things. Uh, Lorenzo, I commit into your hands the husbandry and manage of my house until my Lord's return. For mine own part, I have toward heaven breathed a secret vow to live in prayer and contemplation, only attended by Larissa here until her husband and my Lord's return. There is a, a, a monastery two miles off, and there we will abide. I do desire you not to deny this imposition, the which my love and some necessity now lays upon you. Madam, with all my heart, I shall obey you in all fair commands. Now, my people do already know my mind and will acknowledge you and... Uh, Jessica, yeah, in place of Lord Bassano and myself. So fare you well till we shall meet again. Fair thoughts and happy hours attend on you. I wish your ladyship all hearts content. Oh, thank you for your wish, and I'm well pleased to wish it back on you. Fare you well, Jess Jessica. Now, Balthazar, as I have ever found thee honest true, so let me find thee still. Take this same letter and use thou all the endeavor of a man in speed to Padua. See thou render this into my cousin's hand, Dr. Bellario, and look what notes and garments he doth give thee. Bring them, I pray thee, with imagined speed unto the Tranet, to the common ferry that trades to Venice. Waste no time in words, but get thee gone. I shall be there before thee. Madam, I go with all convenient speed. <laughs> Come on, Larissa, for I have work in hand that you yet know not of. We'll see our husbands before they think of us. What? Therefore, haste away, for we must measure 20 miles today. <laughs> Is Antonio here? Ready, sir, please, of this. I'm sorry for thee. I'd come to answer a stony adversary, an inhuman wretch, incapable of pity, void and empty from any dram of mercy. I have heard your grace has taken great pains to qualify his rigorous course. But since he stands obdurate, 
and that no lawful means can carry me out of his envy's reach, I do oppose my patience to his fury, and am armed to suffer with the quietness of spirit the very tyranny and rage of his. Go on and call the Jew into the court. He is ready at the door. He comes, my lord. Make room and let him stand before our face. Shylock, the world thinks, and I think so too, that thou but leads this fashion of thy malice to the last hour of act. And then tis thought, thou show thy mercy, and remorse more strange than is thy strange apparent cruelty. And where thou now exacts the penalty which is a pound of this poor merchant's flesh, thou wilt not only loose the forfeiture, but touched with human gentleness and love, forgive a moiety of the principal. Glancing an eye of pity on his losses, which have of late so huddled on his back, and now to press a royal merchant down and pluck commiseration of his state from brassy bosoms and rough hearts of flint, from stubborn Turks and Tartars, never trained to offices of tender courtesy. We all expect a gentle answer, Jew. I have uh, possessed your grace of what I purpose, and by our holy Sabbath have I sworn to have the due and forfeit of my bond. If you deny it, let the danger light upon your charter and your city's freedom. You'll ask me why I rather choose to have a weight of carrion flesh than to receive 3,000 ducats. I'll not answer that, but say it is my humor is it answered? Hmm. What if my house be troubled with a rat, and I be pleased to give 10,000 ducats to have it baned? What? Are you answered yet? <clears throat> Some men there are love not a gaping pig. Some that are mad if they behold a cat. Others, when the bagpipe sings in the nose, cannot contain their urine. For affection, master of passion, sways it to the mood of what it likes or loathes. And now for your answer, as there is no firm reason to be rendered why he cannot abide a gaping pig, why he a harmless, necessary cat, why he a woolen bagpipe, but a fuss must yield to that inevitable shame as to offend himself being offended. So can I give no reason, nor I will not, more than a lodged hate and a certain loathing I bear Antonio, that I follow thus a losing suit against him. Are you answered? It is no answer, thou unfeeling man, to excuse the current of thy cruelty. I am not bound to please thee with my answers. Do all men kill the things they do not love? Hates every man the thing he would not kill. Every offence is not a every hate offence. What would thou have a serpent sting thee twice? I pray you think. You question with the Jew. You may as well go stand up on the beach and bid the main flood bait his usual height. You may as well use question with the wolf. Why yet made the ewe bleat for the lamb? You may as well forbid the mountain pines to wag their high tops and to make no noise when they are threatened with the gusts of heaven. You may as well do anything most hard to seek to soften that than which was harder, his Jewish heart. Therefore I do beseech you, make no more offers, use no farther means, but with all plain and brief conveniency let me have judgment. And the Jew is will. For thy three thousand ducats, here is six. If every ducat and six thousand ducats were in six parts, and every part a ducat, I would not draw them, I would have my bond. How shalt thou hope for mercy 
rendering none. <laughs> what judgment shall I dread, doing no wrong? <laughs> you have among you many a purchased slave, which, like your asses and your dogs and mules, you use in abject and in slavish parts because you bought them. Shall I say to you, let them be free? Marry them to your heirs? Why sweat they under burdens? Let their beds be made as soft as yours, and let their palates be seasoned with such viands, you will answer, oh! The slaves are heirs. So do I answer you. The pound of flesh which I demand of him is dearly bought. It's mine, and I will have it. If you deny it, fie upon your law. There is no force in the decrees of Venice. I stand here for judgment. Answer, shall I have it? Upon my part, I may dismiss this court, unless Bellario, a learned doctor whom I have sent for to determine this, come here today. My lord, he stays without a messenger with letters from the doctor and you come from Padua. Bring us the letters. Call in the messenger. Antonio, what man courage yet? The Jew shall have my flesh, blood, bones and all, and I shall lose for me one jot of blood. No. I am a tainted weather of the flock. <clears throat> Meat is for death. The weakest kind of fruit drops earliest to the ground, and so let me. You cannot better be employed, Bassanio, than to live still and write mine epitaph. Came you from Padua, from Bellario? From both, my lord. Bellario greets your grace. Why dost thou wet thy knife so earnestly? To cut the profiter from that bankrupt there. Thou makes thy knife keen, but no metal can. No, not the hangman's axe bear half the keenness of thy sharp envy. Can no prayers pierce thee? No, none that thou hast wit enough to make. Oh, be thou damned inexorable dog! And for thy life, let justice be accused. Thou almost makes me waver in my faith to hold opinion with Pythagoras that souls of animals infuse themselves into the trunks of men. Thy currish spirit governed a wolf who hanged for human slaughter, even from the gallows did his fell soul fleet. And whilst thou layest in thy unhallowed dam, infused itself in thee. For thy desires are wolfish, bloody, starved and ravenous. Till thou canst rail the seal from off my bond, thou but offence thy lungs to speak so loud. Repair thy wit, good youth, or it will fall to cureless ruin. I stand here for law. This letter from Bellario doth commend a young and learned doctor to our court. Where is he? He attendeth here hard by to know your answer, whether you'll admit him. Oh, with all my heart, uh, some three or four of you go give him courteous conduct in this place. <laughs> Meantime, the court shall hear Bellario's letter. Your Grace shall understand that at the receipt of your letter, I am very sick. But in the instant that your messenger came, in loving visitation was with me a young doctor of Rome. His name is Balthazar. I acquainted him with the cause and controversy between the Jew and Antonio the Merchant. We turned our many books together. He is furnished with my opinion, which, bettered with his own learning, the greatness whereof I cannot enough commend... Uh, uh, as it comes with him at my importunity to fill up your grace's request in my stead. I beseech you, let his lack of years be no impediment to let him lack a reverent estimation, for I never knew so young a body. Yes. <laughs> with uh, so old a head, I leave him to your gracious acceptance, whose trial shall better publish his commendation. Here, the learned Valerio, what he writes it. And here, I take it, is the doctor come. <laughs> Give me your hand. Came you from old Bellario? I did, my lord. You are welcome. Yes. Take your place. Are you acquainted with the difference that holds this present question in the court? I am informed truly of the cause. 
Which is the merchant here and which the Jew? Antonio and old Shylock both stand for. Is your name Shylock? <laughs> uh, Shylock is my name. Of a strange nature is the suit you follow. Yet in such rule that the Venetian law cannot impugn you as you do proceed. You stand within his danger, do you not? Aye, so he says. Do you confess the bond? Uh, I do. Then, must the Jew be merciful? <sighs> and what compulsion must I? Tell me that! The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power. The attribute to awe and majesty wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. Oh. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoke thus much to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which if thou follow this strict court of Venice, must needs give sentence against the merchant there. My deeds upon my head, I crave the law, the penalty and profit of my bond. Is he not able to discharge the money? Yes, here I tender it for him in the court, yea, thrice that sum. If that will not suffice, I'll be bound to pay ten times or on forfeit of my hands, my head, my heart. And if this will not suffice, it must appear that malice bears down truth. And I beseech you, Rest once the law into your authority to do a great right, to do a little wrong, and curb this cruel devil of his will. It must not be. There is no power in Venice can alter a decree establish it. It will be recorded as a precedent, and many an error by the same example will rush into the state. It cannot be. A Daniel come to judgment. Yea, a Daniel. Oh, wise young judge, how I do honor thee. I pray you, let me look upon the bond. It is most reverend. Shylock, there's thrice thy money offered thee. An oath. An oath. I have an oath in heaven. Shall I lay perjury upon my soul? No, not from Venice. By this bond is forfeit. And lawfully by this, the Jew may claim a pound of flesh to be by him cut off nearest the merchant's heart. Oh, noble judge, oh, excellent young man. Be merciful. Take thrice thy money. Bid me tear the bond. When it is paid according to the tenor, it doth appear you are a worthy judge. You know the law. Your exposition hath been most sound. I charge you, by the law, whereof you are a well-deserving pillar, proceed to judgment. By my soul, I swear, there is no power in the tongue of man to alter me. I stay here on my bond. Most heartily, I do beseech the court to give the judgment. Why, well, then, thus it is. For the intent and purpose of the law hath full relation to the penalty which here appeareth due upon the bond. It's very true, a wise and upright judge. How much more elder art thou than thy looks? You must prepare your bosom for his knife. His breast, so says the bond, doth it not, a noble judge. Nearest his heart, those are the very words. It is so. Mm -hmm. Are there balance here to weigh the flesh? I have them ready. Have by some surgeon, Shylock, on your charge to stop his wounds, lest he do bleed to death? It's so nominated in the bond. It is not so expressed, but what of that? For good you do so much for charity. I cannot find it. Oh, it is not in the bond!
Uh, you, merchant, have you anything to say? Hmm? But little. I am armed and well prepared. Give me your hand, Miss Anu. Very well. Oh, now grieve not that I am fallen to this for you. For herein fortune shows herself more kind than is her custom. It is still her use to let the wretched man outlive his wealth, to view with hollow eye and wrinkled brow an age of poverty, from which lingering penance of such misery doth she cut me off. No repent but you that you shall lose your friend. And he repents not that he pays your debt. For if the Jew do cut but deep enough, I'll bear it instantly with all my heart. Commend me to your honorable wife. Tell her the process of Antonio's end. Say how I loved you. Speak me fair in death. When the tale is told, bid her be judged whether Bassanio had not once the love. Antonio, I am married to a wife which is as dear to me as life itself. But life itself, my wife and all the world are not with me esteemed above by life. I would lose all. I sacrifice them all here to this devil to deliver you. Your wife would give you little thanks for that if she were by to hear you make the offer. I have a wife whom I protest I love. I would she were in heaven that she might entreat some power to change this currish Jew. Tis well you offer it. Behind her back, the wish would make else an unquiet house. These be the Christian husbands. I have a daughter. Would any of the stock of Barabbas have been a husband rather than a Christian? We trifle time. I pray thee, pursue sentence. <coughs> a pound of this same merchant's flesh is thine. The court awards it and the law doth give it. Most noble judge. And you must cut this flesh from off his breast. The law allows it. And the court awards it. Most learned judge, a sentence. Come, prepare. Tarry a little. There is something else. This one doth give thee here no jot of blood. The words expressly are a pound of flesh. Take then thy bond, take thou thy pound of flesh. But in the cutting it, if thou dost shed one drop of Christian blood, thy lands and goods are by the laws of Venice, confiscate unto the state of Venice. Oh, upright judge, marked you a learned judge. Is that the law? Thyself shalt see the act. For as thou urgest justice, be assured thou shalt have justice more than thou desirest. A learned judge, mark you, a learned judge. I take this offer then, pay the bond thrice and let the Christian go. Here is the money. Soft, the Jew shall have all justice. Soft, no haste. He shall have nothing but the penalty. Oh, Jew, an upright judge, a learned judge. Therefore, prepare thee to cut off the flesh. Shed thou no blood, nor cut thou less nor more, but just a pound of flesh. If thou takest more or less than a just pound, be it but so much as makes it light or heavy in the substance, or the division of the twentieth part of one poor scruple, nay, if the scale do turn but in the estimation of a hair, thou diest and all thy goods are confiscated. A second Daniel, a Daniel Jew. Now, infidel, I have you on the hip. Why doth the Jew pause? Take thy forfeiture. Give me my principal, then let me go. I have it ready for thee, here it is. He hath refused it in the open court. He shall have merely justice. 
and his bond. A Daniel! Still say I, a second Daniel! I thank thee, Jew, for teaching me that Sh word. Shall I not have Barry, my principal? Thou shalt have nothing but the forfeiture, to be so taken at thy peril, Jew. But then the devil give him good of it, I'll stay no longer question. Harry, Jew, the law hath yet another hold on you. It is enacted in the laws of Venice, if it be proved against an alien, that by direct or indirect attempt he seek the life of any citizen, the party against the which he doth contrive shall seize one half his goods. The other half comes to the privy coffer of the state, and the offender's life lies in the mercy of the duke only, against all other voice. In which predicament I say thou standst, for it appears by manifest proceeding that indirectly and directly too thou hast contrived against the very life of the defendant and thou hast incurred the danger formerly by me rehearsed. Down therefore and beg mercy of the Duke. Beg, that thou mayst have leave to hang thyself and yet thy wealth being forfeit to the state thou hast not left the value of a cord. Therefore thou must be hanged at the state's charge. That thou shalt see the difference of our spirit. I pardon thee thy life before thou ask it. For half thy wealth, it is Antonio's. The other half comes to the general state, which humbleness may drive into a fine. I for the state, not for Antonio. Nay, take my life and all. Pardon not that. You take my house if you do take the prop that doth sustain my house. You take my life if you do take the means whereby I live. <sighs> what mercy can you render him, Antonio? The halter gratis, nothing else for God's sake. So please, my lord, the duke and all the court, to quit the fine for one half of his goods, I am content. So he will let me have the other half in use to render it upon his death unto the gentleman that lately stole his daughter. Two things provided more. That for this favor, he presently become a Christian. The other that he do record a gift here in this court of all he dies possessed unto his son Lorenzo and his daughter. He shall do this or else I do recant the pardon that I late pronounce it here. Art thou contented, Jew? What dost thou say? Draw deed of gift. I pray you, give me leave to part from hence. I'm not well. Send the deed after me, and I will sign it. Get thee gone, but do it. In christening shalt thou have two godfathers. Had I been judged, thou shouldst have had ten more to bring thee to the gallows. Not the font. Treat you home with me to dinner. <coughs> I humbly do desire your grace of pardon. 
I must away this night toward Padua, and it is meet I presently set forth. I'm sorry that your leisure serves you not. Antonio, hmm. gratify this gentleman, for to my mind you are much bound to him. Most worthy gentlemen, I and my friend have by your wisdom been this day acquitted of grievous penalties in lieu whereof 3,000 ducats due unto the Jew we freely cope your courteous pains with. And stand indebted over and above in love and service to evermore. Uh, he is well paid that is well satisfied, and I, delivering you, am satisfied, and therein do account myself well paid. My mind was never yet more mercenary. I pray you, know me when we meet again. I wish you well, and so I take my leave. Sir, of course, I must attempt you further. Take some remembrance of us as a tribute, not as a fee. Grant me two things, I pray you, not to deny me and to pardon me. Uh, you press me, Pa, and therefore I will yield. Now, give me your gloves. I'll wear them for your sake. And for your love, I'll take this ring. Oh, do not draw back your hand. I'll take no more. And you in love shall not deny me this. This ring, uh, alas, good sir, it is a trifle. I will not shame myself to give you this. I will have nothing else but only this. And now methinks I have a mind to it. Well, there's more depends on this than on the value. The dearest ring in Venice will I give you and find it out by proclamation. But for this, I pray you pardon me. I see, sir, you are liberal in offers. You taught me first to beg, and now methinks you teach me how a beggar should be answered. But, sir, this ring was given to me by my wife, and when she put it on, she made me vow neither to sell nor give nor lose it. That excuse serves many men to save their gifts. And your wife, be not a mad woman, and know how well I have deserved this ring, she would not hold out enemy forever for giving it to me. Well, peace be with you. I pray you, Lord Bassanio, let him have the ring. Let his deserving and my love with all be valued against your wife's commandment. Graciana, go. Run and overtake him. Give him the ring. And persuade him if thou canst to come anon to Antonio's lodging. Go away. Make haste. You and I will do the presently. And in the morning early, we will both fly toward Belmont. Come, Antonio. Inquire the Jew's house out. Give him this deed and let him sign it. And we'll away tonight and be a day before our husband's home. This deed will be well welcome to Lorenzo. Fair sir, you are well ordained. My Lord Bassanio, upon more advice, hath sent you here this ring. Ah. And doth entreat your company at dinner. Uh, that cannot be. His ring I do accept most thankfully, and so I would you tell him. Furthermore, I pray you, show my youth old Shylock's house. Well, that I will do. Uh, sir, I would speak with you. I'll see if I can get my husband's ring, which I did make him swear to keep forever. Thou mayest, I warrant. We shall have them swearing. They'd give these rings away to men. <laughs> um, oh, away, make haste. Thou knowest where I will tarry. Come, good sir. Will you show me to this house? Shines bright. In such a night as this, when the sweet wind did gently kiss the trees and they did make no noise, in such a night, Troilus, methinks, mounted the Trojan walls 
and sighed his soul toward the Grecian tents where Cressid lay that night. Such a night did Thisbe fearfully outtrip the dew and saw the lion shadow wear himself and ran dismayed away. <laughs> in such a night stood Dido, with a willow in her hand, upon the wild sea banks, and waft her love to come again to Carthage. Such a night, Medea gathered the enchanted herbs that did renew old Eason. <laughs> in such a night, did Jessica steal from the wealthy Jew and with an unthrift love, did run from Venice as far as Belmont. Such a night, young Lorenzo swear he loved her well, stealing her soul with many vows of faith, ne'er a true one. In such a night, did pretty Jessica, like a little shrew, slander her love, and he forgave it her. I would have met you, but hark, I hear the footing of a man. Who comes so fast in silence of the night? A friend. A friend? A what friend? Your name, I pray you, friend. Stefano is my name, oh. and I bring word. My mistress will, before the break of day, be here at Belmont. She doth stray about by holy crosses, where she kneels and prays for happy wedlock hours. Who comes with her? None but a holy hermit and her maid. I pray you, is my master yet returned? He is not, nor we have not heard from him. But go we in, I pray thee, Jessica, and ceremoniously let us prepare some welcome for the mistress of the house. Sweet soul, let's in and they'd expect their coming, hmm? And yet, no matter. Why should we go in? My friend, Stefano, signify, I pray you, within the house, your mistress is at hand, and bring your music forth into the air. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank. Here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. Soft stillness and the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Sit, Jessica. Look how the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with pateens of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdst, but in his motion like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed cherubins. Such harmony is in immortal souls, but whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. I never marry when I hear sweet music. The reason is your spirits are attentive. For do but note a wild and wanton herd or race of youthful and unhandled colts fetching mad bounds, bellowing and neighing loud, which is the hot condition of their blood. If they but hear perchance a trumpet sound, or any air of music touch their ears, you shall perceive them make a mutual stand, their savage eyes turned to a modest gaze by the sweet power of music. Therefore the poet did feign that Orpheus drew trees, stones and floods, since naught so stockish, hard and full of rage, but music for the time doth change his nature. 
A man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night, and his affections dark as Erebus. Let no such man be trusted. Mark the music. we see is burning in my hall. How far that little candle throws his beams. So shines a good deed in a naughty world. When the moon shone, we did not see the candle. So doth the greater glory dim the less. The substitute shines brightly as a king until a king be by. And then his state empties itself as doth an inland brook into the main of waters. Music. Ha. Ah. It is your music, madam, of the house. Nothing is good, I see, without respect. Methinks it sounds much sweeter than by day. Silence bestows that virtue on it, madam. The crow doth sing as sweetly as the lark when neither is attended. And I think the nightingale, if she should sing by day when every goose is cackling, would be thought no better a musician than the wren. How many things by season season are to their right praise and perfection. That is the voice, or I'm much deceived of torture. He knows me as the blind man knows the cuckoo by the bad voice. Dear lady, welcome home. We have been praying for our husband's welfare. Which speed we hope the better for our words. Are they returned? Madam, they are not yet, but there is come a messenger before to signify their coming. Go in, Melissa, and give orders to my servants that they take no note at all of our being absent, hence. Nor you, Lorenzo, Jessica, nor you. We are no telltales, madam. Fear you not. This night, he thinks, is but the daylight sick. It looks a little paler. Tis a day such as the day is when the sun is hid. We should hold day with the Antipodes, and you would walk in absence of the sun. <laughs> let me give light, but let me not be light. For a light wife doth make a heavy husband, and never be Bassanio so for me. God saw to all you are welcome home, my lord. Oh, thank you, madam. Good welcome to my friend. This is the man. This is Antonio. To whom I am so infinitely bound. You should in all sense be much bound to him, for as I hear, he was much bound for you. No more than I am well acquitted of. Sir, you are very welcome to our house. It must appear in other ways than words, therefore I scant this breathing courtesy. By yonder moon, I swear you do me wrong. In faith, I gave it to the judge's clerk. <laughs> Would he were guilt that had it for my part, since you do take it, love, so much at heart. A quarrel? Who oh, already? What's the matter? About a hoop of gold, a paltry ring that she did give me, whose posy was for all the world like cutlass poetry upon a knife. Love me and leave me not. What talk you of the posy or the value? You swore to me when I did give it you that you would wear it till your hour of death, and that it should lie with you in your grave. <laughs> For me, yet for your vehement oaths, you should have been respective and have kept it. Gave it a judge's clerk. <laughs> God's my judge, the clerk will know where Heron's face that had it. He will, and if he lived to be a man. Aye, if a woman lived to be a man. Ah, oh, by this hand, I gave it to a youth, a kind of boy, a little scrubby boy, no higher than myself, the judge's clerk. A prating boy who begged it as a fee. I could not, for my heart, deny it him. You were to blame, I must be playing with you. To part so slightly with your wife's first gift. A thing stuck on with oaths upon your finger, and so riveted with faith unto your flesh. I gave my love a ring, and made him swear never to part with it, and here he stands. I'd have sworn for him he would not lose it, nor pluck it from his finger, for the wealth of the world masters. Now, in faith, Graciano, you give your wife too unkind a cause for grief, and were to me, I should be mad at mm. it. My Lord Bassanio gave his ring away unto the judge that begged it, and indeed deserved it too. And then the boy, his clerk, who took some pains in writing, begged mine. And neither man nor master would take aught but the two rings. What ring gave you, my lord? Not that I hope which you received of me. If I could add a lie unto it. 
it were a fault, I would deny it. But you see, my, my finger, <laughs> it's not the ring of point. It is gone. Even so void is your false heart of truth. By heaven, I will ne'er come in your bed until I see that ring. Nor I in yours till I again see mine. Sweet Portia, if you did know to whom I gave the ring, if you did know for whom I gave the ring, and how unwillingly I parted with the ring, when naught would be accepted but the ring, you would abate the strength of your displeasure. If you had known the virtue of the ring, or half her worthiness that gave the ring, or your own honor to contain the ring, you would not then have parted with the ring. What man is there so much unreasonable? If you had pleased to have defended it with any terms of zeal, wanted the modesty to urge the thing held as a ceremony. And Arissa teaches me what to believe. I'll die for it, but some woman had that ring. No, upon my honor, upon my soul, no woman had it, but a civil doctor. Let not that doctor e'er come near my house. Since he hath got the jewel that I loved, and that which you did swear to keep for me, I will become as liberal as you. I'll not deny him anything I have. No, not my body, nor my husband's bed. Know him I shall, I am well sure of it. Lie not a night from home. Watch me like Argus. If you do not, if I be left alone, now by mine honor, which is yet mine own, I'll have that doctor for my bedfellow. And I, his clerk. Therefore be well advised how you do leave me to mine own protection. Well, do you so. Let not me take him then, for if I do, I'll mar the young clerk's pen. Oh, I am the unhappy subject of this quarrel. Oh, sir, grieve not you. You are welcome, notwithstanding. Sweet Portia, pardon me. And upon my soul, I swear, I never more will break an oath with thee. I, I, I once did lend my body for his wealth, which but for him that had your husband's ring had quite miscarried. I dare be bound again, my soul upon the forfeit, that your Lord will never more break faith. Advise me. Then you shall be his surety. Oh. Give him this, and bid him keep it better than the other. Dear Lord Bassanio, swear to keep this ring. <laughs> By heaven, it is the one I gave the doctor. I had it of him. Pardon me, Bassanio, for by this ring that doctor lay with me. And pardon me, my gentle Graciano, that same scrubbed boy, the doctor's clerk, in lieu of this, last night did lie with me. Why, this is like the mending of highways in summer, where the ways are fair enough. What, are we cuckolds ere we've deserved it? Oh, speak not so grossly. You are all amazed. Here is a letter. Read it at your leisure. It comes from Padua, from Bellario. There you shall find that Portia was the doctor. Nerissa there, her clerk. Lorenzo here shall witness, I said, for the soon as you and have but now returned. I have not yet entered my house. Antonio, you are welcome. And I have better news in store for you than you expect. Unseal this letter soon. There you shall find three of your Arguses are richly come to harbor suddenly. You shall not know by what strange accident I chanced upon this letter. I am dumb. Were you the doctor? And I knew you not. Were you the clerk that is to make me cuckold? Aye, but the clerk who never means to do it, unless he live until he be a man. Sweet <laughs> doctor, you shall be my bedfellow. And when I am absent, then lie with my wife. <laughs> Sweet lady, you have given me life and living. For here I read for certain that my ships are safely come to road. Well, how oh. now, Lorenzo? My clerk hath some good comforts, too, for you. Aye, and I'll give them him without a fee. There do I give to you and Jessica, from the rich Jew, a special deed of gift after his death of all he dies possessed. Fair ladies, you drop manna in the way of starved people. Tis almost morning. And yet I'm sure you are not satisfied of these events at full. Let us go in. And charges there upon interrogatories. And we will answer all things faithfully. Let it be so. The first interrogatory that my Nerissa shall be sworn on is whether till the next night she'd rather stay or go to bed now, being two mm -hmm. hours today. <laughs> but were the day come, I should wish it dark. 
that I were couching with a doctor's clerk. <laughs> well, while I live, I fear no other thing so sore as keeping safe Nerissa's ring. <laughs> Pizza dolce, pizza dolce, 